Hello and welcome everyone to Blockchain Week. Today's panel is talking on shifting business models through NFTs, music and media, and it's proudly brought to you by CoinSpot. I'm going to hand over to the moderator, Jamison. Over to you, Jamison. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the panel. Today, we're going to be talking about how this nascent technology of NFTs impacts artists, collectors, investors alike. Um, my name is Jameson. I'd first like to apologize for speaking to you through this baby gorilla cartoon. Uh, anonymity is actually very common in the NFT space, but it is decisively less so at national conferences. So uh, with that out of the way, it is my pleasure to introduce our illustrious panel to you today. First up, we have Joan Westenberg, at Joan Westenberg on Twitter. Uh, Joan is a Web3 writer, angel investor, and creative director. She founded a tech PR and communications firm called Studio Self and has been named one of the leading startup voices in Australia by a smart company. Uh, Joan's writing has been published in just about every publication worth reading. Uh, next, we have Mark Carnegie. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Mark. Uh, wow. Fantastic. At I am Mark Carnegie on Twitter. Uh, Mark is the founding partner of MH Carnegie, an asset management firm with over $900 million AUM. Uh, and in preparation for this panel, I read an excerpt about Mark, which described him as a tough talking, big thinking investor with a combustible temper and a taste for profanity. So, so this should be a fun conversation. Uh, finally, we have Domino at Domino's Music on Twitter. Uh, Domino is a multidisciplinary artist focusing on music and visual arts to tell conceptual and personal stories, uh, specializing in rap, poetry, film, and performance. Domino aims to make you feel and think. Now, before we get into the swing of things here, I'm going to pass it over to our panelists to fill in any gaps from the intro and uh, perhaps tell us a little bit about how they came to be active in the NFT space. So uh, Joan, let's hear from you first. Sounds like she's on mute. Joan? Yeah, I'm, I'm not getting Joan's audio either, uh, unfortunately. Okay, neither is Domino. Uh, we'll hand that over to the tech team and uh, we might... Okay. Oh. oh, no, you're there, Joan. You yeah, just okay, back again. All right. Good, good, good. Um, yes, I'm Joan. I'm having technical difficulties today. I just moved house, so you'll have to bear with me. Um, the, only, the only gap I can think of in that bio is that I do make a really mean red source that doesn't get enough credit and should get a whole lot more attention on Twitter, but then I should talk about it more. The key is butter. <laughs> Like so much butter. Um, the how key to the... life is so much butter, Joan. It really is. Honestly, the butter the better. Exactly. <laughs> um, NFTs and butter. <laughs> it's all just it's all just enriching the experience. Um, obviously, I'm a transgender woman. I am a a, a blogger, a writer, and I do a, a lot of my my daily work is with MotorDAO, where we are building out, I guess, the future of blockchain music through technology, tools, platforms, and community. We're working on audio fingerprinting tools that enable you to track the genesis of your NFT the first time it is minted onto the blockchain. And we're doing a lot of work with some very cool partners there. So that's kind of the, the overall picture of me. I got into the space just because I am a creative and I'm an investor. And so NFTs and Web3 are kind of the ultimate nexus of those things. You know, I spent a lot of time touring around in a crummy van playing punk rock. And I spent a lot of time turning up at pitch nights, investing in startups. And between the two things, NFTs just drew me right in. But both of those things sound like the perfect Genesis story for NFT life, Joan. <laughs> uh, Mark, over to you. Uh, yeah, so I got drawn into this by Axie and the whole play to earn space and a whole series of challenges I'd seen with some um, small philanthropic initiatives that I've been making in Africa in terms of trying to advance the cause of getting people who are excluded in the world's economy into it. We were simultaneously trying to do a coding school up in um, up in Papua New Guinea, and it just seemed so clear to me that the NFT space was going to be a far, far lower friction on ramp for people to become engaged in the world and in the world economy. It's now become sort of mainstream that the metaverse is coming here um, to all of us, but my key focus is on the excluded couple of billion people in the world. 
Secondarily, I think there's a great opportunity for the creator economy to take back economic rents from the centralised platforms, Instagram and Google particularly, um, and do something that really will rebalance the power between capital's unprecedented high share of um, GDP and Labor's unprecedentedly low share. So that's the reason I'm here. Sounds a bit airy, airy fairy, but I'm as much a red-blooded capitalist, capitalist as anybody else, and I'm certainly here to make money as well. <laughs> that, uh, that's a fantastic intro. I, I, I look forward to talking a bit more about that later. Uh, later. Um, and Domino, I've saved you for last because I'm going to throw the first question at you after this. So the floor is yours for an introduction. Awesome. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, um, I came into the space kind of fully as a creative and I've done uh, drawing work, collage work, photography, film directing, editing uh, and music and so many other crafts for pretty much my whole life um, that once I saw NFTs, it just kind of like blended everything together for me in a way that was uh, just making sense. I had been an independent artist for the last decade and it's, uh, it's had its extreme up, ups and downs and uh, some of the harder parts being building an audience that uh, can help support you um, and also giving back to them. So once I saw everything, it just, it just made so much sense to me. And uh, yeah, I dived in completely. Um, last year, I dropped an album as NFTs uh, with a custom contract and this whole um, tech side that um, made a lot of movement and um, very recently did a Rolling Stone and Coinbase collab and that was a lot of fun and since then uh, I'm just keeping it moving and um, yeah <laughs> I think that's it for sure awesome fantastic thanks Domino now I know we've only got 25 minutes well probably 20 minutes now uh, which puts me well and truly outside my comfort zone because I'm usually hosting three hour Twitter spaces. But I have a few questions prepared for each of you guys on the panel. And then if we have time afterwards, I've crowdsourced a few questions from my Twitter followers as well. Um, please feel free to jump in and interrupt me at any point. We can make the conversation as organic as possible. Um, so uh, the music NFT landscape has really flourished over the past 12 months. Uh, we've seen everything from you know, one of one collectorship through to generative projects, DAOs, uh, royalty sharing services, um, as well as disruptive moves from, uh, you know, events, companies, and record labels, and even merch. Um, Domino, from an independent musician's perspective, help us understand how the traditional music industry is uh, broken, for lack of a better term, and why NFTs are uh, potentially a great solution for artists. Yeah, I mean, it's... The, the music industry has been the same for such a long time with labels uh, being gatekeepers and uh, being the way onto radio and being the way onto touring and um, a lot of ad work and syncs and so many things. And once streaming came in, it, it became a playlist game and which is also gatekept uh, mainly by label owners and, and uh, so many other people that as a, an independent artist, not trying to sign and give away full creative rights and essentially be given a loan, um, you have to like go through the mud for so long to build a core fan base, to fund yourself and fund videos and fund photo shoots. And, and on top of that, all the ad placements and rehearsal spaces, everything that you could think of, that uh, it becomes really difficult really quickly um to continue with a high quality product um and so the nft space just kind of provides every solution to that possible uh by giving collectors and essentially fans the ability to uh exchange with the artist and also like make money with the artist which is kind of unheard of completely um besides like collectibles and rare items from uh, historical moments and in, in music history from huge artists and stuff um it's a bit unheard of especially for independent artists so um, there's an unlimited amount of, uh, options that we can run as creative musicians, um, from blending, uh, different ways of dropping using NFT tech with multiple mediums to tell stories, um, with collaborations to, um, like fully running it in, into crypto and DeFi with staking to 
um, give tokens to give access to other things and it it becomes um, something new really quickly. Yeah, absolutely. And tell us a little bit about your personal experience developing NFTs for your music. Like, uh, obviously, at some point yeah. you were you were brand new to this, and there was a lot to learn. Um, what What did you find most challenging and most rewarding about the process? Yeah, like um, I started minting in February of 2021, so it's been like just over a year. And even just in that time, it's been this complete overhaul of change in the space. Um, there weren't music platforms uh, and music wasn't even really a thought besides from like some certain huge artists. Um, so I just, I was dropping visual art. I was uh, dropping drawings, different drawing collections and paintings um, and then started doing spoken word and then started doing film. And then I had to take a step back and saw that it was a huge opportunity to, to um, give an album out in a new way that hadn't really been done before. Um, so the the marketing assets became pieces um nft pieces they became art pieces um that promoted and hyped up the album that hyped up the music um and that was really really interesting to me and uh that every piece of the puzzle to advertising something can now not only be an art piece but also be a collection uh, a collector's item and then also something that um can benefit someone else as an investor and holder it's just uh, it's been a lot of fun and, um, giving holders creative decisions has been very, very interesting musically, um, and has brought on a, a lot of different things that, uh, I never thought was really possible before, um, NFTs and the tech that it provides. Um, so yeah, the, the harder parts were just, um, making it unique in a space that was so overran with so much. Uh, and kind of not focused on uh, conceptual art as much in a hype way. Um, so exploring that and and seeing how I could um, collaborate with different platforms and have partnerships with different platforms in order to push it more um, and other things like that um, became kind of the the difficulty. Yep, understand. Uh, there's a really interesting conversation I think to be had around collectorship versus utility and how those things intersect. Um, and, and talking about like innovations, particularly social innovations, uh, there've been quite a few DAOs formed around music NFTs over the past, you know, 12 to 18 months. Um, I was going to throw it over to, to Joan. Um, can you give us a bit of an overview of the DAO landscape as it pertains to music and your experience with Motor DAO? Yeah, absolutely. So I think DAOs are in a really interesting space right now where, um, they have been a trend, they've been an exciting thing, but people are starting to step back and say, okay, well, we've created a DAO. What does that actually mean for us? What is our responsibility now that we've done so? You know, there is a, a fair bit of misconception about what a DAO represents in practice. You know, I, there was somebody on, on LinkedIn the other day who uh, had a very popular post talking about how every NFT is actually a DAO, even if it's um, completely centralized, which is obviously wrong, but there's all these ideas floating around because it's such a buzzword. So my experience with DAOs has been largely positive. The landscape is, it's growing, it's vibrant. People are coming up with ideas, people are launching DAOs. But I think we've yet to reach that level of maturity where we can point to the various like successful DAO case studies and just say, this is what works, this is what doesn't. You know, people are developing ideas around governance, people are developing ideas around structure, regulation, and so on. With Motor DAO, for example, we just recently brought on and started developing the role of DAO master, which is, is based on the Scrum methodology and it's a, a decentralized role enabling somebody to come in from the community to drive various community projects, trying to get over that DAO inertia problem that we often see. But there are all kinds of experiments that are in play with different companies trying to try out you know, DAO structures. I think the important thing to think about is, does the project I'm working on need to be a DAO? And if so, why? And if you have a really good why, how will you actually execute it to ensure that governance is truly decentralized and that it truly does serve the community you know there's all these questions that you really have to ask yeah definitely it definitely still in its infancy in some ways but has mm. has come a long way um and one of the things that i find attractive about DAOs is they seem uh sort of naturally more conducive to um like equality within the space and uh you, you actually recently published a, an article in your Substack. 
uh, uh, titled tokenize, I'm, I'm going to say tokenize effing everything because I don't even know if we're allowed to swear here, but you know, tokenize effing everything. Um, uh, in that article, you're right. It's clear that tokenization has the potential to change the world as we know it by making everything from data to assets more easily trackable and secure, we can create a better, fairer world for everyone involved. I was hoping maybe you could speak to the idea of like fairness, equality, how, how tokenization can help promote that, how we can strive towards it, whether DAOs come into it all, just your experience with that. I think we, we already do live in a very tokenized world. It's just that we as individuals don't necessarily have the power or the control over those tokens. You know, I mean, what are our tax file numbers and so on other than tokens that essentially like define who we are and align us with government structures and power systems? What I'm trying to say here is that my idea of a tokenized world is not one in which, okay, everything's an NFT. It's one in which through owning your own token, owning the tokenization of your assets, your data and so on, you get to choose who has it, who accesses it, who does what with it. And so it, it's not necessarily about, hey, I'm going to sell everything I own or license everything I own. It's about, hey, I'm going to make the decision not to do that. I'm going to make the decision to protect my privacy, to protect who I am, my identity, because I am the one who controls that token. And that's kind of more what I think about when, it, when it's examining a, a, a freer, more equitable world. You know, it's rebalancing that power structure by giving more people access to the control around who they are, what they are, what they say, where they say it, when they say it, and how. And I think we don't really have that at the moment. You know, we have very definite power imbalances because, I mean, society today, like we are, whether you're talking about our social structures, our social groups, our demographics, the way we live, the way we lay out our suburbs and cities and the way we, we have laws and regulations and so on, it's all based on traditions and, uh, and a foundation from hundreds of years ago. It's essentially trying to run um, the latest Mac OS on a Commodore 64. Like that, that is the disparity that we have between where we are today in who we are as a society and what we've built it on top of. And so I think kind of taking a step back and asking how we can rebuild some of those infrastructures is only going to be a positive thing. Yeah, 100% agree. And for those who don't know, um, Joan has a, a fantastic Substack, and uh, uh, the, I find the writing really uh, engaging. So you can jump over to her uh, Twitter and um, you'll find that there. Uh, time is racing away from us at a startling pace. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to throw it over to uh, Mark. And uh, Mark, as, a, as, a, as an investor, uh, what is it about NFTs and digital asset ownership that sort of convince you to focus both your time and your capital on the space to some extent? Well, I always worried about Metcalf's law in Web 2.0. Um, it's great for a starting, startlingly small number of companies that cascade to monopoly, um, and therefore they're great economic businesses, but I didn't think they were particularly societally productive um, the businesses that ended up being realestate.com or car sales or Google or Facebook. Whereas I've got a hope here that in fact, there's gonna be groups of people who wanna escape from that environment and create better economic structures that allow um, profits and revenues to be shared more equally. And I think that you've gotta go back to Kevin Kelly's thousand true fans essay that was about the same time as the Genesis block um, was minted on Bitcoin to give you a sort of intellectual underpinning of what we're talking about here. What he said was, you can find a thousand people who really, really um, are interested in what you're doing. And if you can get each of them to spend $100 a year, that's $100,000 of income. And that is not for any creative person um, beyond the realms of possibility. And I don't know how many artistic friends you've got, but $100,000 a year, and he was talking US dollars, is a huge amount for the average artist to have in terms of sustaining themselves and not being forced to couch surf um, and eat other people's food after they've left the table. So I felt like it's a really, really powerful thing there. And then my sense is that the questions about Dow governance are what I call fractal to Plato. They go back to the questions that Plato was asking about governance. But as Joan says, what it allows us to do is hit control or re reboot 
on governance structures and not just carry on the way that we used to carry on when the mail was the only way to communicate and therefore you were a delegate in one particular way um, in your democracy. Now that's not the case. Now, I'm probably a bit utopian in, in that my belief is that most people want to be part of the radical centre and they don't like the extremism that's popping up on social media these days. And so I feel like we're a bit tyrannised by the crazy 5% on either end at the moment. Um, and I feel like Web 3.0 and the whole NFT environment is going to create permissioned access that allows people to actually force better conduct, a bit like Reddit um, promised, but then you know struggled to find how to deliver. So this all sounds a bit airy-fairy, but I do genuinely believe these communities that come out of the fog are going to be incredibly productive. Um, they're just going to look much more like Rotary or the Lions Clubs of the 1950s or the Quakers of the 19th century than they are any of these, you know, one person's got super voting control over a monolithic international company. Yeah, fantastic. I, I genuinely wish we had more than 25 minutes. We could talk about that for hours. Um, I'm glad you mentioned Kevin Kelly, um, that, that seminal essay. I, I think I, I had a tweet a few months ago that basically said in this space, uh, it's sort of potential for people to have 100, 100 true fans, not 1,000 true fans, uh, you know, if they sort of work and play their cards right and, uh, and develop a, an engaged community. Mark, um, a little bit of a loaded question, and of course, nobody's here to provide financial advice, but what areas of the NFT space do you see presenting a great opportunity for investors over the next few years? Well, what I say to everybody is please don't think about this as a capital thing. Think about it as a labour thing. The opportunity here is to take, you know, 7, put 7 to 15% of GDP away from int financial intermediaries and put it back into your side hustle or your labour, uh, uh, economic return on your labour. You're probably spending three to four hours a day on... Um, social media at the moment, essentially working as a, a slave for Google or Facebook. Um, this is an opportunity for you to take that labour, think through the Kevin Kelly idea about being a creator, develop some NFTs like Domino's been able to do and take economic control back for that. So my fundamental point to people is this is a labour game. Everybody's trying to play it as a capital game. Um, I think that's wrong. You know, I can give you the bull case and the bear case for Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, and I've been, you know, widely, quite widely quoted as, as saying the hype cycle here is just out of control and prices are, you know, way, way detached from reality. So I'm not a person pushing the let's go and spend huge amounts of money in this space. I'm somebody saying give up your job and join the NFT space because the profit share share of GDP is going to be lower and the labour share of GDP is going to be higher. So that's my fundamental point. And then the second point, I'm sorry, this is too exhaustive, is what I've said to people is if you're in my sort of view about where your asset allocation should be, which is, you know, single digit percentage um, allocation into crypto and maybe closer to, you know, less than 5%, you know, 2 3 4%, then I think there's every chance that even if you dust all the investment you've made into crypto, you will have learnt about how technology is going to change the world in such a way that the rest of your portfolio is going to benefit enough to more than make up for your 1% to 3% investment in crypto. So that's my view, which is your world just completely changes when you're in this space and you see things so differently. Your, your view about your traditional portfolio changes radically as well. Thanks, Mark. Unfortunately, the tyranny of time limits has gotten the better of us and uh, we are five seconds away from our limit. So I just want to thank you all so very much for, for um, sharing your, your time and your thoughts and your expertise with us today. Um, and I hope to catch up with you again in the future. Fantastic. James. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.